So again, welcome to uh, the webinar. Uh, my name is Todd Wallach. I'm spending the year as a Berkman Klein Neiman Fellow at Harvard, and I've been a data journalist at the Boston, uh, Boston Globe uh, for about seven years, as well as an investigative reporter, uh, working both with the Boston Globe Spotlight team and the rest of the newsroom. Uh, Caroline Chen uh, covers healthcare uh, for ProPublica, and she previously was a reporter at Bloomberg News. Uh, Armand Imamjoba uh, is a graphics assignment editor for the Washington Post, uh, and he was previously a deputy director of data visualization at the Los Angeles Times. And I was excited to have this group of people talk about the issues that journalists face dealing with data because we all have some different expertise. I'm sort of a, a generalist. Uh, looking at data, trying to find mine it for all sorts of types of stories. Caroline is more of a specialist in healthcare and will have more expertise in healthcare data. And Armand has uh, lots of experience in visualizing data. And there's, it seems like there's been tons of interest and challenges in looking at COVID-19 data. A lot of it's been, people have been trying to track it by day and time to, to see trends and whether it's getting worse or better, as well as geographically. Uh, but there have also been a lot of challenges, such as obstacles trying to obtain the data. Uh, so you've seen a lot of headlines about that, particularly a local level or getting more details on the data, such as uh, the the race or age or other details about people affected, uh, and questions about the accuracy and reliability of the data. Uh, ProPublica and New York Times and others have, have written a lot of stories raising questions about you know, the accuracy and the, the challenges comparing one area to another because of difficult variances in who's tested, how accurate the tests are, how accurate death counts are, and, and other issues. Uh, so. I'm going to start by asking a number of questions, and uh, at about 12.35, we'll switch to questions from the audience. So feel free to start tossing in questions as we speak, and about halfway through, we'll start going to audience questions and finish at one. OK, um, I want to start off just by asking uh, Armand and Caroline, uh, what data have you seen readers most interested in? Should I hop in here? Um, I think um, early on uh, the questions were just, you know, where where is the disease spreading, right? So I think um, obviously, um, especially in the U.S., um, as the virus first started to hit, everybody just wanted to know case counts. Um, and then I think um, that started to soon overlay with uh, a concern about deaths. Um, and so I think that continues to be of interest, you know, case and cases and deaths. And then I would say, you know, where, where are the tests and, and testing capabilities, um, testing capacities? And I think now there's an understanding that there are two types of tests, so the di diagnostic tests, um, those are the PCR, the swab tests, and now the, the new incoming antibody tests. Um, and I think the more sophisticated readers are starting to gain an understanding um, of, you know, what do uh, the, the numbers mean as we're starting just like right now this week, starting to see studies um, come out uh, with uh, some numbers around these uh, antibody studies. Um, and there are already furious debates around uh, those study results and whether or not those are meaningful. Um, so I, I, I see those as layering, right? Uh, we continue to wanna care about uh, case counts, and we continue to want to care a lot about uh, death and, you know, segmentations of those. So demographics and race um, and, and, and who are being affected. Um, and these are layering as we go. And Armand, what have you seen? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, definitely along the, the same lines of that pattern. You know, it's, um, it has been like, 
case counts and where there were reported um, reported cases and reported outbreaks, um, you know, deaths. Uh, and now I think uh, the one thing I can add to what Carolina said is there's been interest in like the trends that are being reported by states as well. Um, so, you know, we've, um, you know, made steps to show like, what does this data look like over time? Um, you know, of course, noting the caveats in the data and how it's being reported and recorded by the states. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention, of course, like there's a there's the whole conversation around supplies, PPEs, uh, ventilators. Um, it's obviously been very hard. Uh, that's always a moving target, uh, depending on whether you're talking local level, national level. Um, you you can you can never put a nail on how much PPE there is at a given hospital state, um, but there's always interest in in that question of supplies. Uh, and I'm also curious about how easy or difficult has it been to obtain all the data for your stories and, and graphics? Um, I can talk about that. I, I think, you know, um, the data at a national level is basically, you know, kind of non-existent. Like if everything is reported at, most things are reported at the state level. Um, so that makes it, that means, you know, you have to either rely on an aggregator or aggregate the data yourself, you know, going to all these different state sites, for figuring out where they report it, how they report it, in what format. Um, also noting that this data, what the states are reporting also changes over time and, and what platforms they're using to report it. Uh, I said... I sent out a tweet like a few days ago that was like, what if you were reporting a live election, um, but you were reporting, you were building your rig for reporting the results as the election was happening and what everywhere was reporting as the results was also changing and they were changing how they report it as well. So um, it, it has been like extraordinarily difficult in that sense to sense to build things that don't like constantly break and build data flows that are that are actually kind of stable given the fact that like what's moving uh what is being reported is moving under them as well yeah um i would say that there are certain things that just by the nature of the pandemic are going to be constantly changing so for example testing capacity um, I've done a lot of reporting around uh, testing and testing capacity and uh, just by the nature of what's happening that is changing constantly. So whether that's nationally, whether that's locally, if you're trying to say, you know, like, what is the testing capacity of my state, like that number is going to be constantly changing and it should be right because we are, we have been constantly ramping up testing capacity. Um, so for any reporter to try to get a beat on that and try to inform their, 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 their local readers. Um, they'd have to constantly update that. Is it possible to actually get an accurate number at any point in time? I think that that is technically possible, but your number is going to be outdated like within an hour, um, even at a specific lab. So I have, you know, at certain points been able to be like, I nailed the number, it's already old. Um, is there any point in even doing that? Yeah, I think there is, uh, there is, it's a worthy exercise to try to get a ballpark um, and to track trends for readers. So there have been times where I've tried to do that for specific stories, but it is a, a frustrating exercise and I've really encouraged other reporters to really try to explain to readers like where you got this number what has gone into this number and like how long of the shelf life the number will have and really try to like show show your work to your readers more than I normally would um, so I think some of that is inherent there are other things though where you can only your your it, information is only as good as where you get it from. So for example, like the WHO puts out daily situation reports. Um, that is the only way you can really get in, uh, a source for international case counts, right? But the WHO's information is only as good as the countries from which it comes from. So I keep like repeatedly explaining this to people that um, the WHO has a recommended way for what they count as a positive case. And they say that it is like, if you test positive with like a PCR based test. For the longest time, China just decided that they were only gonna count as positive um, someone who had a positive PCR test and symptoms. 
they were not counting people who had a positive PCR case, but no symptoms. So they weren't counting asymptomatic cases. There's nothing the WHO can do about that. There's nothing anybody can do about that. And then after a while, like China changed that. So you needed to know that about China. Um, and I mean, that's deeply frustrating. You can't get everybody to report the same way. And you need to have those caveats in your reporting. And this also trickles down to like, you know, 50 states and or yep. 56 states and territories all doing it in their same way as well. Right. Yeah. That's got to make comparisons really tricky when everyone has a different way of reporting the data, tracking the data. There are different rules on who gets tested and what gets counted. It sure does. <laughs> and again, like, yeah, I mean, I think we, you can only be clear about like the caveats of like, this is entirely dependent on, on how, on what's being reported and how it's being reported. And Yeah, I've been very, very cautious about comparisons. Got it. Uh, and are there any other problems you've noted in the, the data that people should be aware of? I have been very careful um, or I've been encouraging, you know, reporters uh, in my newsroom and, and trying to explain to the public just to be aware of, you know, what the definitions are of numbers that get thrown around. So one thing, for example, I've been trying to explain a lot to, to lay readers is like, what is the, what actually is the fatality rate, right? Um, and there's a big gap, I think, between what the public wants to know, which is, you know, if I get infected, will I die? and what is reported as the case fatality rate, right? So the case fatality rate is the number of reported deaths divided by the number of um, lab confirmed infections. So everybody knows in the US, it's really, it had been really hard, it continues to be really hard in many places to get tested in the first place. And a lot of places are not testing unless you're really, really sick. So that denominator is gonna be much smaller than the actual number of infections. So. Um, especially early on in the United States, the case fatality rate was something like 10% um, because we just weren't testing a lot of people. And like the, you think of it as like an iceberg model, like the deaths are usually the easiest to find and count, especially early on in a pandemic. This always happens in a pandemic. And the people who are like asymptomatically infected are the hardest to, to find in the first place. But again, like the average lay reader they just want to know if I get infected, will I die? And they're looking at that number that's being reported in your headline. And they're just looking at that and be like, that's like, if I, if I get infected, like that's my chance of dying. And like, we have such a huge responsibility as reporters to explain that number and not just like throw things around in headlines. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of numbers like this um, as a science and, and health reporter where like, I feel like we have a lot of it responsibility to explain to people. So like, like that, um, you know, are not and are, these are like, um, you know, the, the, the rate of um, infection, like the chance you have of, it, of, of um, infecting other people, the average number of people you infect, which it's a process of understanding. And I, this is what I'm trying to get across to my readers. Like there is so much we are still learning um, that we don't know yet. And we cannot present this as set in stone. And um, building on that, like mentioning the, you know, the all cases being kind of a, a difficult fraction to divide against, like the deaths number also is slippery that we've, you know, we've, we've seen stories highlighting this in recent days. And it's been something we've been kind of saying for a while is like, not every death is being accurately categorized to like recently, New York City added some, what was it like 3,700? I forget the exact number um, of deaths that were classified as like, probably COVID-19, you know? Um, so, uh, and you know, if it's happening in New York City, it's probably, there, there is some fraction of cases that's being, um, that that's being, you know, miscategorized throughout or, or never even recorded. Um, you know, so that number is slippery as well. And I think when talking about like fatality rates and, and that kind of thing, rather than just talking about one big number, um, we've been, uh, you know, we've been trying to, when we have the data available, at least break it down a little bit better into like segments of the population or, or, or report that comorbidities that studies have been reporting. So it's not like, you know, a flat 
3.2% or whatever it would be, you know, it, it, it depends on a lot of factors that are related to the individual. Yeah, it definitely sounds challenging when there are questions about and uncertainty about both the numerator and the denominator when you're trying to calculate rates. Uh, you know, my sense is that these are problems that data journalists also and, and journalists in general encounter when trying to get data. Uh, it's often hard to get one clean database at a national level or global level. We're often aggregating it from lots of different places and each place might have different ways of counting the numbers and reporting the numbers and the data can be messy. Um, is there anything different that you're finding in dealing with COVID-19 data or does it reflect challenges you've faced doing other types of stories? This is more philosophical. <laughs> But, you know, it, this, these numbers are being reported by states and by countries and everywhere, like, very precisely. But in its nature, it's a very imprecise, like, count. Um, so there's this weird um, situation. You know, it's, like, inaccurate but precise um, is, is one type of, yeah, of, like, data classification. And I think that's where we are now. It's, like, you're throwing you're, – you're, like – taking shots at a dartboard and they're all landing at in a very exact same similar place, but you know, you're off somewhere. You're not, you're not actually hitting the dartboard. It's like somewhere, somewhere off of the wall because you're throwing the darts kind of blindfolded, but we have very precise counts. Yeah. I, I, one thing I've seen, and I guess my, I know this is a really hard thing to do, especially, you know, if you have an editor that's pushing you, um, is is to resist the urge to write um, because what I do see is that uh, health departments as they release data are refining as they go um, and I think this is because they are also figuring out what they need to release so for example um, to give a very specific example New York City started out by giving test um, they were only reporting by uh, borough and then a lot of people were like, well, that's not enough information. And they, they were getting a lot of criticism and then they started releasing. Um, it wasn't quite by neighborhood. It was by this very strange, not quite zip code, not quite neighborhood. And they released, um, it was percentage of positive but they didn't have any raw numbers. There were no numerator, no denominator. It was percentage. And I was like, well, I can't do anything with that because if you say that in this zone, it was like 66% positive, like that could mean that you only did three tests there and two people tested positive. Like that's meaningless. Um, but I did see some news organizations like write a story on that. And I was like, that's a bit dangerous. And then I think like within a week, they then re-released numbers, which were by zip code and had numerator denominator. Like they had way more information and then you could write a more meaningful story. And then like New York City has continued to update and iterate and give more and more granular information. Um, so I do think that there is a benefit to kind of waiting because I, I've seen more than I've ever seen before in any other outbreak I've covered, um, sort of health departments, um, iterate as they go with the data that they're releasing. And I, I, I actually see, because this is happening across the country, actually reporters, I think, be able to push health departments and be able to say, hey, you know, like, Ohio released this information. Florida, why aren't you releasing this information? And be able to sort of, like, push departments off of each other. And I think in a similar theme, um, I think it's really sometimes dangerous to write a story off of a, a preprint. I do think it's really great that scientists are, uh, researchers are moving quickly um, and sharing information on like meta archive and bio archive and not waiting to go through that whole process, but then it's not peer reviewed, right? So this puts you in a really dangerous position as a reporter to have to like write a story off of a non peer reviewed um, study. So I think one of my goals is to never let a preprint walk alone. Um, as in you don't write a story on a preprint by itself. You try to let it go like in, um, in concert with other studies and look for a trend or at least like let lots and lots and lots of people comment on it and 
don't just write a story on this. So this is happening right now with all these antibody studies, right? Like Stanford put out um, its preprint on its antibody sero survey. And there were a, a lot of stories that got written really quickly. And then in the next day, there has been the, the critique wave of like, was it a good survey? Was it biased? You know, like all of that stuff. And I just wish that a lot of reporters might have waited a little bit. And now there is the Los Angeles Cerro survey. And I think you could have maybe waited and collected a bunch of these studies and maybe done one thoughtful story in one go, or at least gotten a lot more outside voices than you normally would before writing um, that one story, because they aren't peer reviewed. So you do have to treat preprints -pre differently. Right. Uh, and interestingly, of course, none of our articles are peer reviewed. So I'm curious what process you go through to make sure that your own interpretations and analysis uh, are, are sound before publishing. Uh, I, I just run preprints by uh, way, way, way more people than I, I normally would with, you know, if something's already published in a journal, um, I know that it's gone through that peer review process. If it hasn't been, I will run it by a lot more outside experts uh, than I normally would um, and just go that extra mile and really ask myself, like, do I have to write this now? Can I wait for it to... Uh, go through that peer review process. And you can ask the author. Sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, this has already been accepted by JAMA or The Lancet or whatever. And that gives me an extra measure of confidence. Um, if that's the case, that's helpful to know. Um, and if not, and it's like, you know, this is such an important study that I need to write about it right now, then I get all those outside voices. I try to get many independent outside voices that are um, from a number of different institutions, get all their critiques. And if all of them are really really negative, then again, I have to ask, like, why am I writing about this study in the first place? Like, the bar just gets so much higher um, if it's not um, in a journal and hasn't gone through the peer review process. And I assume, uh, Caroline, even when ProPublica or Post or others are doing their own analysis, we do the same thing. We'd go to outside experts and say, here are the numbers I'm calculating. Does my methodology make sense? Does this, is there a good explanation for these conclusions? Rather than just posting something on, on Twitter or throwing it on our website, um, we first normally talk to experts first. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, there's a bit of like self-analysis in here too, like looking at what we call data smells, you know, it does what's in the data question, your basic assumptions of it, you know, does it show an opposite trend to what you're expecting? Are there massive gaps or negative values where there shouldn't be, you know, it's kind of like sanity, sanity checking the data as well. And, and similarly, I know there are questions about uh, different models that organizations are using. A lot of people are looking at the University of Washington model. It has a website that's very easy to use, predicting when peaks are going to be for hospitalizations and other issues. But there are lots of other models, it seems, and uh, there are questions about what variables go into each model, how the numbers are calculated, and they can produce conflicting results. So that has to be challenging to deal with. Yeah, so I did a whole column on <laughs> forecasting and projections earlier on, um, where, which was partly for reporters and partly for, for um, you know, the public. And I, and I think, again, the question really is, like, who is your audience, right? And who are you writing for? Um, and, I, and one thing that I try, I try to keep that at the back of my mind, because I think there's a difference here. Like, if you are writing for really a lay public, um, again, you have to remind them, like, is this an estimation, right? And um, I was talking to, for, for that particular column, I, I, I was talking to an epidemiologist and I said, you know, I was reading this, this sentence that somebody had written about their, their particular model and I said, it seemed awfully specific um, where they said that, you know, this means that in New York, this was, this was back in early March, that, you know, last week there were, you know, a, it was something like, 1,583 to 2,000, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was like down to the digit uh, number of people infected. And I was like, I read that sentence and to, I feel like it gives a lay audience this 
sense that you can be that precise and calculate down to a single digit how many people are infected. And for me as a writer, I would never give that level of precision because it signals something to a reader. I would give, I would round and use the words around, you know? And I said, what does this say to you as an epidemiologist? And it was really interesting because she said, I like seeing that sort of precision because from one epidemiologist to another, I can then go and redo his model and make sure that our numbers match exactly. So it's very useful from one researcher to another. But I agree with you, for a lay audience, that's not the message we want to send. Because I said, what is the takeaway you would want for a lay audience? I, she said, the takeaway I would want a lay audience to hear is, it's not 400 and it's not a million. You're in the low thousands. You know? So really, like, that's the kind of the question that I always, when I'm talking to someone who's doing modeling, I say, what is the takeaway you would want for a lay audience? Like, are we talking, and, and really she said with, with, with models, you're just, you're, you need to be thinking in orders of magnitude. And I think that our responsibility as reporters is to then say, okay, so I'm going to give an orders of magnitude type of number to my readers. Got it. And I'm, I'm also curious, are there any mistakes that you see lots of people repeatedly making that that bug you. One I see all the time is people say, oh, there have been 4 million people tested, if, if there have been 4 million tests. But some of the tests require multiple samples. Uh, people could have been tested multiple times. So there are different numbers. I also see people say, oh, there are this many cases when it's number of confirmed cases. And there are other studies showing there are probably many times more people who've been infected but haven't been uh, tested. Yeah, that uh, the one that you just mentioned, Todd, I think is the one that I've seen most often just in like talking with people in he hearing that like, oh, this place has only five cases. And it's like, well, no, not, I mean, yeah, but no. <laughs> um, you know, that has just been what's reported and what's, um, what's being conveyed, like being reported by the states. And again, that comes back to this, like what Caroline was just saying about this precision implying that we know, you know, there are 526 cases in this county in Illinois or something, you know? Um, but, you know, maybe that's on us to, I know the, the like instinct is to try and report the data that we, to the granularity we have available, but maybe there are better ways in that, that we do report the data that implies more of this imprecision about the data. Um, you know, that's, that's something I think we can ask ourselves and address as we try to put together these pages that are like tracking the spread of the disease um, or whatever. Um, another one is like just people being exposed to types of scales and visuals that they're not used to seeing. So like we're seeing a lot more logarithmic scales than we're used to and they don't chart things that, you know, that growth doesn't look the same way on a log scale. Uh, than, than a linear scale, but if you're looking at it and think you're at, on a linear scale, then you might think things are like declining or flattening out when actually that is very much not the case, you know? Yeah, I, I, I think Todd, you picked up on, on, on my, my biggest pet peeve is, is people not paying attention to units, right? Like, and I've kind of been, um, <laughs> this has been like my soapbox rant for the longest time is like, please try to get your units in people. Um, because uh, I think, again, like that is what people, readers care about, right? They, they see a million tests and they think that that is a million uh, uh, people. You, you know, they, when you say like, we can, we, we're rolling out a million tests, they will automatically think that is a million people who can get tested. And depending on the type of test, and this is like absolutely confusing, like the CDC test, you had to divide by two, the Abbott test, the, the, the rapid test, it is one test per person. So depending on which test you're doing, it, it, it is a different equation. And, and, and it really is a reporter's responsibility to figure out what the heck is, is being said. And so it is, um, and it is a way for, frankly, for officials to inflate numbers. Um, and so it is, and it's the only way to really get an apples to apples comparison is if we get a testing capacity in people. Um, 
And, and so I think that's a journalist's responsibility to always get the units and people. Um, that way we can compare, you know, state by state, country by country. Um, so I do think that that is, that is a, a mistake. I, well, a mistake or I think a confusion that, that annoys me uh, when I see that. Um, and yeah, I think just not explaining um, that, uh, you know, everything should be like, this is a reported number of, of, of deaths or reported number of, of cases at this point in time, as Armand said, I think those are, those are really common. Um, I think also just, this is, this is more philosophical, um, is, it's just presuming we know things, you know, I, I, I mostly see this, uh, uh, frankly, on, on Twitter and on TV, but just this air of like, we know what to do. Like, if, if, if this state just did this, then like, we would solve the, the crisis. Like, no, like, nobody knows what to do. We have only known this like humanity has only known this virus since January. Well, or I mean, in China, it was a little bit earlier than that. But in the US, we haven't really known it that long. And every time I, I dig into this, whether it is on really understanding how it is transmitted, or I recently was doing a lot of reporting on, you know, doctors struggling to understand how best to use ventilators, um, how to best treat critically ill patients. Um, everybody is struggling to do their best by patients and, and to really understand uh, what to do. And so I think there are no easy answers in this crisis. And um, I think you can give, I think this is a failure of communication, um, both um, by our, our officials and also actually by, by journalists when we make it sound like there is an obvious or easy answer. Um, and, and failing to, to acknowledge that, like, to some degree, we are all still learning. Um, and so that, that irks me whenever it comes across as like, well, obviously. That, that sounds good. Uh, why don't we go to uh, questions from the audience that are starting to pile up. Uh, one that's been upvoted the most is from a Berkman fellow, Bao Bao Zhang, who wondered how you feel about non-experts uh, weighing in with their own analysis on Medium or, or Twitter or elsewhere and non-journalists and not all of those people do what journalists do is going to experts first to vet their, their conclusions. Um, I, I definitely feel like, you know, it's a free, it's a free society and that's what a, um, platforms like Medium exist for. So um, I, you know, yeah, you're specifically uh, citing uh, Thomas Poyo's Hammer in the Dance. Um, I, I think it's fine if people want to publish, and I think that they definitely find their own audiences. I do think that things like that sometimes are, like, I think they find their own audiences, basically. Like, I, I had a lot of people actually send me that specific post and be like, I cannot understand this. Can you, like... <laughs> write a version that is like, that like hand holds a little bit more. Um, because I think the, the part where oftentimes like experts who are experts in their field, whether they're like data scientists or like, I see this a lot where like a clinician or somebody will be writing, they use a lot of, they tend to use a lot of jargon and don't break it down uh, to the degree that I tend to try to do. Um, and uh, some, some people do, some people are fantastic communicators naturally, but I think that's a tendency that I tend to see a lot of jargon. Um, and so um, uh, I, think, I think there's a place for them. And then I think sometimes there's the, the, the shortcoming is that I think they're not trained to be able to use the language that like helps them reach as many people as they could um, and to give as much context as I think like a journalist would, would know how to do. That's my off the top of my head answer. Okay, that's good. Uh, there was also a question about, you know, how do we deal with issues where, you know, we publish an article based on data and then the data changes or the information changes, or this probably comes up all the time with healthcare studies, Caroline, where a new study comes that contradicts a past study or a study has been retracted. So how, how do we deal with this when people are still passing around the old article or, or chart based on old outdated data and information? Yeah. Oh, then what a nightmare it is right now with this situation. So one thing I am doing now even more so than I normally do is I am aggressively dating 
my information. Um, like all, like it's in my stories on my sentence, I'll say like, you know, this fact as of Wednesday afternoon, you know, according to the Association of Public Health Labs, you know, there were like the U.S. could uh, had a testing capacity of a million tests as of Wednesday afternoon, because literally by Thursday morning, the number is going to change. So I try to like um, tag as much of my information as possible. Like I'm linking a lot more aggressively than I, than I normally do and also adding the date and timestamps. So wh whenever whoever comes along to my articles sees that information, they will know as of when that information was, was true. So unfortunately, like some people are not going to read that carefully, but at least the, the, the timestamp will be next to that. So I cannot go back and update my articles constantly, but at least the information that somebody reads will, will have a timestamp next to that. So I think that's probably the best thing you can do. And then, um, and then yes, like update as you, as you go. And I think again, this is where the language that you use at the time you write also helps you write because I also say use language like at this time, scientists understand this to be X. So like when I was working on a column about asymptomatic transmission, there was a lot of language I had in there, which was like, as of now, scientists understand that whatever. So again, like there's a date at the top of my article. I'm using a lot of language that indicates like I'm giving you the best of understanding at this time. And then I'm also linking to studies and putting language in that's like, as of this interview that I did on this date, this is what I was told. So I think sort of all of that in combination, hopefully, even if a reader comes along later, uh, we'll know that that was information that was current at the time that I wrote that article. And I think that's the best you can do. Yeah, and um, from a data viz standpoint, you know, we can either build our pages and apps to like plug into live data that updates um, so that, you know, you are seeing updated data as of like, you know, the timestamp at the top of the page or right on the chart or whatever. And, you know, again, we try to be transparent about when that data is updating um, or, like Caroline says, we can, we can build it statically um, with like an illustrator or just save it as a static SVG and, you know, have to make clear, very clear that this is data as of X. Otherwise, you know, we've been in situations when we're trying to publish a story and like, we just have to keep updating the charts like five times because the data keeps changing um, as we're, as we're writing the story. Yeah. And other more subtle things like, um, so ProPublica normally does really long sort of deep dive investigations and actually our, our, social, um, our social folks are used to just like retweeting our stories like forever because we often are doing such long retrospective investigations that you could like retweet our stories like two years from now and like there's no reason why somebody couldn't read them again later and we've completely reconfigured that so like they no longer will retweet a story uh, because they know the information could be totally old uh, so even thinking about that like your your social strategy um, they will check in and be like can I still tweet this story from our main account? Is that information still new? Like um, thinking about that kind of thing um, and then obviously if there's some really major new information. Like for example, if I had written a whole column on asymptomatic transmission and there's some really major information that's really relevant to know, I will put an update at the top of that story. So being selective. Okay, that's the, both good points. Uh, next question is from Eva Wolfangel, who's a, a Knight Science Journalism Fellow, who asks about the fact that you know, researchers often try to communicate uncertainty. Um, and I guess there are two challenges journalists face. One is how to communicate that same uncertainty. And then there's also the question, do we undercut our own stories and reporting and data when we communicate that uncertainty? Are people just going to say, oh, it's, it's an estimate. It has such a wide range. It has a margin of error. You can't really rely on it. How, so how do you deal with those challenges? I mean, I try to convey that in describing the process of science, right? So just to give a very specific example, um, I was, you know, in, in the column I was working on on asymptomatic transmission, there was a part where I talked about how um, 
new studies have shown that you know, viral load is actually higher at the start of the disease. Um, course of disease um, for uh, COVID-19, which means that you could be more contagious um, even before symptoms started. But I, I went out of my way to explain how this is unexpected because for uh, COVID-19's close cousins, like coronavirus cousins, SARS and MERS, um, you were most contagious, you had the highest viral load um, in the middle of the course of disease you know, when your symptoms were highest. Um, and I think just like explaining that, which would be like why your natural presumption would be, uh, the original presumption was that COVID-19 would behave the same way, is something that like any reader can understand that like naturally you'd look at historic models and be like, you'd expect it to behave the same way, you know? And just, I think like trying to explain the process of science um, helps. And I feel like, I just over explain. And I think like showing that uncertainty or even just saying things like, um, uh, I, I, I just was working on a story about like ventilator use and I had a, I had a clinician give me a number and then he, he, he called me back and he was like, you know, but like, you know, that number I gave you, like, I just like, I know you hate this, journalists hate this, but like, it might change. And I was like, no, 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 that's fine. Like, that's, that's fine. And I appreciate that you, you wanted to clarify that. So then I just added a line, a very short line saying like, you know, he added that it's early days and more information will be gathered. And I, I think that's fine. Um, and a good indicator to, to readers that like more studies are going to happen. So I definitely feel like there are ways for readers to indicate that uh, or for writers to indicate that for their readers. Yeah, and from a visual standpoint, I mean, uh, in terms of like how to communicate uncertainty, uh, look to the annual discussion every hurricane season about how to like chart the likely path of a hurricane. Um, you know, it's like visuals, you want to give somebody something to look at um, that, that tries to convey the data as best as possible. And I think with these, in, in the case of uh, this outbreak, uh, the best we can do is like, you know, work that into the, um, you know, to the kind of the chatter and the headline around the chart and the annotations, you know, say that it's reported cases or confirmed cases or reported deaths, um, try and convey the uncertainty in, in like what's around the chart rather than the numbers, which are what's actually being reported and what we actually have to chart. Got it. And, uh, I want to take on a question by Saul Tannenbaum, who asks about questions raised by COVID skeptics, who will often point out when we report deaths, um, argue that they're overcounted or completely, uh, or there are no COVID deaths in extreme cases and say, well, they're really dying from a heart attack or they're really dying from pneumonia or they're dying from some other cause. And yes, they tested positive for COVID, but that wasn't necessarily uh, what caused their death. How do you deal with those types of questions? That's interesting. Um, I think that that I don't know that that's like a useful debate right now, right? Like I think like all you can do because I think you can have that debate at like either end, right? Because then you get into the debates on, you know, the people who are dying at home, like and like, did they die of COVID? Did they die of not COVID? Like, how do you then count like the the people who, you know are the like excess impact from COVID because they, they died at home because they didn't want to go in for help or like, you know, like I think you, there's so many swirling questions around death related to COVID that are going to be so hard to untangle. And I think like as journalists, the only thing you can really do is just be really straight and really flat and be like, here are the number of people who died with a positive, um, with a positive COVID test and just like leave it at that. And then here are the number of people who died at home and here is how it compares to the number of people who died at home like last year at the same time and like show that gap if you, if you are able to get that number from your state. Like I, I just don't know that you can, that those debates are really helpful or like getting into those weeds and trying to parse that is going to get anywhere at this point because you can have that same debate about the flu. Like, 
well, so and so had a positive flu test, but did they die of their underlying condition or did they die like their pneumonia came from the flu, but they also had diabetes? What does that mean? Like, I, I just don't know where you'll get with that. Yeah, agreed. And, yeah. Um, you know, it reminds me of like after Hurricane Maria when they went and did studies of like, you know, what did the excess mortality rate look at like in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. It also like I worked on the homicide report at the LA Times for several years and you know the LA County coroner if uh, somebody was shot and then died like say 10 years later of complications from that gunshot wound like eventual health impacts it's still ruled a homicide that you know because that they they died because of complications from that gunshot wound um so you know th this is not just solely restricted to covid-19 data it's just uh, mortality statistics statistics in general right uh another question that came up is what is the most reliable source for uh covid-19 data uh, and I think there are at least a half a dozen sources that have aggregate, aggregated national data and uh, a couple sources with global data. Armand, go ahead. Yeah, uh, most reliable is the key. I mean, you know, um, Johns Hopkins has really been putting in tons of work into aggregating uh, as much data as possible. Um, you can take a scroll through their issues list on GitHub just to kind of deal with the, or to get an idea of the volume of requests this has generated. Um, you know, we, um, and, and of course the World Health Organizations and then, you know, everybody, like I, I think a number of media organizations, including us are also trying to aggregate at the US level, like state data and county data. So. I can't yeah. tell you which is the most accurate. I would say just for US case counts, we, we mainly use uh, John Hopkins data. Um, we long ago gave up on the CDC, which is very unfortunate <laughs> to have to say that, but they don't update on weekends and they are like 24 hours behind on their weekday updates. So we use uh, Johns Hopkins for just our daily case counts. Um, in terms of like testing capacity, we mostly point to the COVID tracking project. Um, depending on um, international, sometimes uh, depending on what it is, WHO or JHU. Um, but again, it really depends on exactly what you're trying to get at. Got it. And of, of course, sometimes for very local stories, there may be only one possible source of data coming from a county or coming from a hospital or, or something. Yeah. And country. actually going to your local health department might directly is probably going to be the most up to date information, which will be even faster and more up to date than going to a site like JHU, frankly. There was also a question from Magna Cheney, who's a, a Neiman affiliate, uh, asking about the best practice for archiving stories. So uh, Caroline, you mentioned having a time date stamp can be one way. Um, uh, yeah, um, the Guardian does this thing where they have a warning up really high um, where they say like warning the story is like more than a year old or they have some sort of very visible warning up high, uh, which I always appreciate whenever I see that. Um, so that could be one way to do it. Okay. And Michelle O'Neill asks, well, what can we report that's meaningful without having the basic data that we want? And I guess that comes up with when we want to say, you know, what states, or what, where are the hotspots or how, are, how is the U.S. doing versus other countries when there are all these questions that we've brought up about how many people are actually infected given the differences in testing and how many people have died given differences in counting and because of all this uncertainties with numbers it must be really challenging to figure out what we can really say with confidence yeah agreed i mean i think we need to make like basic assumptions or adjustments when we can you know for denominators that don't exist or for other things that are that we don't consider reliable like um, on our 
um, on our pages that show the data that we know about um, cases and deaths throughout the country. Like instead of normalizing, um, we, we're looking at like cases per per population or known cases per like population of the state, um, per population of the area. Um, you know, but again, we have to be clear that like we don't. This is all just based on what's being reported. Okay. There was also a question with, what do you do when you don't have data or information or you have conflicting data so you, you can't be sure? Do you just avoid writing about it or do you write about, about it as, as best you can? It's certainly difficult to make charts when you don't have data. Well, I do think that there is a there is value to writing about the lack of information, especially when you feel like your, say like your local health department is withholding information that should be public, right? So I think that there was early on um, a lot of good journalism being done about the need for um, uh, demographic information about who was being infected, right? And, and now we're getting a lot more of that information, which is pointing out like big problems in, in, in who is being infected. Um, so, I would not dismiss that as a possibility for where you start reporting um, on just the lack of good information, um, which can actually uh, spur change and get you the information that you then want. Great. Uh, so I think we are just have time for one last question. Um, Gina Pavone um, at, notes that there's talk of doing using an app for contact tracing. There's a project at MIT for that. Uh, and there's also been uh, stories based on cell phone data that's been released. And Gina wonders how uh, journalists deal with uh, aspects of, of privacy or reporting on the you know, sort of the challenges of releasing that data and using that type of sensitive data and making the topic accessible to a mass audience. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this is, <laughs> this is a hot topic across a lot of, um, a lot of different countries, uh, a lot of different localities. Um, and I think they're, like one, you know, really understanding the nitty gritty of how it's going to be be used is 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 important. I think there are a lot of think pieces about these apps right now that I'm seeing, which ask a lot of like philosophical and hypothetical questions. Um, but I see way fewer stories that actually get into the innards of of how they're going to be used, which would actually help answer some of these think pieces. So I think that would be useful journalism to be done. Um, it's it's much easier to be like, but what about privacy? But then you don't actually know what's going to happen. I think the other question, though, uh, which was raised with me with some um, public health experts that I asked was like, how is this going to actually intersect with the existing public health infrastructure, right? Because if there are a bunch of people who have downloaded an app and it's not talking to uh, public health officials and not um, helping them do their actual work, that's also useless, right? So this needs to fit into the existing public health ecosystem. So I think there's a lot of good reporting that can be done around that. Um, and then again, like this needs to fit into existing testing capacity. There's no point in having like a great contact tra tracing app if you then can't test people um, and find out who is sick in the first place. So um, there's a lot of questions about like, do we have like a very shiny um, looking object um, that doesn't mesh with, you know, the actual uh, realities of needs. Um, and I think helping people understand, your readers actually understand how this app needs to fit into the actual workflow of containing the virus. Like all of those things um, can be helpful to your readers. Um, and, and then ultimately also just like the mathematics, right, of how many people would actually need to download the app for this to be useful um, in, in uh, achieving what it needs to do. Because there needs to be, there is a minimum number of people who need to have the app for, for, for a contact tracing app to work. Got it. Well, thank you so much. Um, thanks for the panelists and for everyone who uh, tuned in. There will be a recording available uh, in a couple days on the Berkman Klein Center event page. Uh, and there's also going to be a quick
poll added survey at the very end. Um, so thanks again for uh, Armand and, and Caroline, and thanks for everybody who was watching.